just keep her through cards and a wishing well. Prayed for a love to call his own, a love to break the spell. Welcome to the Red Pill Buddhas podcast for red pilled Buddhas everywhere. Revolutionary, free thinking spiritual people who've woken up from the mainstream narrative on various levels. And I interview some of the most fascinating ones here. Please also visit thehumanunleashed.com for hundreds of hours of our video content on all areas of health, lifestyle, and much more. And theredpillrevolution.com for our five star reviewed book and subsequent publications in the Red Pill series as they come out. So, welcome to this episode of the Red Pill Buddhas podcast. And I've got a bit of a hero of mine on today, and it's Mary Ruddick. Mary Ruddick is got a fantastic healing story, but also she's a nutritionist, adventurer, explorer, militant vegan activist. Well, maybe not the last one, but Mary, it's it's great to have you on. Honestly, your your healing journey and your podcasts, uh, particularly the ones if nobody's seen them with Brian Sanders. Um, going around all the tribes. I think there's four or five of them and they're absolutely fascinating going around the tribes in Tanzania uh, and wonderful stuff. So uh, Mary, welcome. Great to meet you at last. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Same. Feel the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful to get some time with you. <laughs> I'm very honored. It's just me. Oh, well, listen, you know, for people who haven't heard it, just definitely um let us know about your your healing journey a little bit about your healing journey before we get into your adventuring because it, it, it was it was a wonderful journey and I, I just love hearing that having had one of my own you know I just love these stories so so tell people what happened I do too I really I don't know if you did this Phil but when I was uh, disabled in bedbound I really collected people's stories and it was so helpful so I, I so agree with you, you useless, for me, useless I grew anecdotes up Mary <laughs> useless anecdotes What's that? Oh. U- useless anecdotes people call them but how useful are they they're beautiful <laughs> oh, I, they kept me alive they kept yeah. me inspired yeah because yeah. I figured if someone had healed from something incurable whatever it was then it was possible for me too I, I mean we're not that different so they really were like a light in a very dark cave so it was good I think the more stories we get out there the better I for me I grew up very healthy I was an athlete I was about as average as you can get and I always knew I wanted to explore the world and travel I thought I wanted to work with animals I really wanted to be a marine biologist so at 18 I moved to the Bahamas to live on a field station and study marine biology. And about halfway through the semester, we're kind of rough camping. It wasn't as glamorous as it sounds. I mean, I loved it because I was a teenager (laughs) and I still would, but that's my personality. But about halfway through, a bunch of us on the island got very sick, and I, I assumed it was just a flu when I got it myself. But uh, similar to what's happening with some people with COVID, or what happened with people with polio, there's a small subset of people that have a very severe reaction in the nervous system and the immune system. And I was one of those. So after that, I ended up disabled for 12 years, uh, really not able to walk well at all. And for many years in bed, fully, fully dependent on other people to feed me and care for me and all those things. And of course, as you know, having had a chronic illness, it's different in different years. And as the illness went on, it got much, much more severe and uh, and much more disabling as well. So it started with something called dysautonomia, which used to be <laughs> a great, uh, a great Scrabble word, but now people have learned what it is. <laughs> now it's not so rare. Now 70 million people have it. It used to be quite rare. And uh, and POTS, and then it, as the circulation got worse and worse and the nerve damage got worse and worse through the years, I got to pretty severe kidney disease, liver disease, lung, thyroid disease, lots of autoimmunity in several organs and uh, neuropathy and all sorts of things. So uh, so all that was pretty hopeless. And I had, I had lost so much weight. I think I was about 87 pounds and I'm 5'8", so you can imagine. And, uh, and And so I started to do a lot of work internally. I didn't have any solutions. You know, this was really before 
this is really before YouTube and maybe, I mean, I, I wasn't aware of it anyway. <laughs> and I was really mostly in a room by myself, basically like white walls. I didn't have a computer or a TV or a phone. I didn't have anything to distract myself and I wasn't cognizant enough to be reading for many of these years. And so what I did instead was I started to learn ways to handle the pain and to get at the mind and the lifestyle. So I kind of started to work at healing from a very different standpoint. I didn't start with diet uh, because I wasn't healthy enough to, to be honest. I didn't have someone who would cook those things for me. And when I started to implement the meditation and, and all these kinds of lifestyle things that now have become pretty common, light therapy and, and these kinds of things, reframing thoughts to be neutral and, and all of that being very present, uh, then I kind of had space from the pain and from, from the illness, and I was able to slowly do more and more. So after a few years in bed, I was able to very slowly get out. <laughs> it started with shoulder lift exercises and then went to biking for 30 seconds, grueling biking. And I became very methodical, which wasn't my personality, but it was what was required to get out. So I really became very, very organized and dedicated and disciplined and uh, really did exactly the same thing every day. So I could measure increases and see how I see how I responded. And I also really worked at not responding directly to the symptoms, which I think uh, when I see people go through their own healing journeys, I wish I could teach that to people sooner to not react with emotional responses <laughs> to their to their symptoms and to not take them so seriously if they've already we already have the diagnosis or serious things have been ruled out just to kind of let it go and focus on something neutral so helpful but as I started to get my strength back uh, I just dove into reading and I ended up spending the next few years just reading books on healing people who had healed uh, I always loved the adventures so I read a lot of the the books of the the past explorers from the 1800s and from that I started to fall into nutrition and I started to think oh, maybe I've been doing everything wrong you know at the time I I did the juice cleanses the raw diet the pH cancer diet the things we all do right <laughs> and, and I had already been vegetarian for about eight years so I thought I was doing so well and and those books really cracked my mind open because here were these groups of people who were eating exactly what we were told not to and they were in perfect health so I was like right changed today so I started eating meat right away and started learning more about some of the the early dietary researchers like Weston A. Price and kind of following those methods it was another couple of years after that to where I found the diet that ended up putting me into remission but they were a couple of beautiful years I mean every day felt like a new exploration new uh new discovery and I just I couldn't get enough at that time it was utterly joyful so at the end of all of that 12 years, I found The Gaps Diet by Dr. Natasha McBride. And I did a version of that that is a bit more, uh, it was very ketogenic <laughs> and it was just soup. I just ate chicken soup and five other, five foods total for two years, but it was incredibly effective. I, at the time, you know, I was on 17 medications, some very, very expensive ones. One, one alone was 2000 a month and uh, a breathing machine. And after a year, a year of that diet, I was off of everything and back at college finishing. So, so it was just, I have chills now. It was just an amazing time where it just felt like anything was possible, which I, I still believe. It's, it's a wonderful, it, it, it mirrors my journey quite a lot there, you know, just completely stuck on the sofa in agony and just doing all that sort of inner work and then gradually coming out, you know, I was doing diet stuff as well. I could still stagger around painfully and, and, and cook or at worst juice, you know, and I ended up 120 pounds at five foot 10 with kidney stones. Oh. So oh, you no. know, the, the juicing of the spinach really didn't do much good. It didn't do much good for the joints either, but. And no, then it's the it worst was, thing for you. Yes. Actually, horrendous. And, and it was, it was, uh, interesting the same kind of progression and finding Natasha Campbell McBride stuff and had to go a bit further than that I found that the chicken was hurting me too you know yes uh, a lot of people have that yeah yes. yeah but um 
but yeah, it's seven years carnivore now and just, you know, 60 years old and playing crazy in energetic gigs and lugging drums around doing festivals. And 10 years ago, I thought I'd never do that again. So it's just yeah. beautiful, isn't it? How, how these things come around. But yeah, hell of a lot of study when people go, but you're not a doctor, what do you know? I mean, the, the amount of study we have to do to come round to, maybe we should have just looked at a cave painting. I think, I really think, well, maybe, and maybe this is where I'm from. I'm from a place that just really values education above anything else and, and puts doctors on pedestals. But I don't know about you, I saw so many and I didn't get better. So, so I, I really feel that in all fields, we should judge things by their success rates and nothing else. And we should really see like what's getting the results are, and are we looking at that? I, I so often will see my parents will go to say a lymphoma uh, organization or fundraiser or something. And they'll say, oh, it's this fantastic doctor that's running it. And I'll say, well, what are his success rates? And no one knows, <laughs> you know? So we, we tend to give accolades based on other things, maybe on completing uh, studies or certain degrees, these kinds of things. But I think at the end of the day, especially if you've been sick like you and I have, what really matters is, are you getting better? <laughs> that's what really matters and I think anyone who gets better can give advice I I really feel that the old adage back in the day of uh, uh, only wounded healers right in many tribes you cannot become a healer unless you've gone through something yourself and reversed it I think there's a lot to it because it gives you a, a humbleness and it gives you a, a real life uh, touchstone to what it's like to actually be sick and I, I don't know how how you can work with such sick people if you've never been there yourself. Yeah, it is. It's huge in consults, isn't it? To be able to be there on, on somebody's level and you, you can say that you've been through such and such. You're, you're exactly right about the success rates. I mean, something I always say is, you know, about rheumatologists, that if you if you got a plumber into your house to fix a burst pipe and he said, I'm sorry, I don't know how it's happened and I can't fix it. Would you pay him? But this is exactly what the rheumatologists are doing. They don't know what causes arthritis and they can't fix it. But people go to yes. them, flock to them. Very strange, just fear mongering, really. But I mean, on a, on a diet level here, you've seen, you've been out there and seen way more of these indigenous people than 99.9% .9 of, of the population. What on earth has gone on that we've forgotten about that? How is it that we really think that we get health through seed oils and quinoa and stuff like that. What's going on? I think, and I can only speak from an American perspective here. I know I've lived overseas for a long time, but we're shaped by our childhoods in many ways. In many ways. I, I know at least in America, I, I think it's simply that our food industry is an industry. Same with our health industry. It's an industry. And when you have an industry, the end goal is financial. I don't think anyone was sitting personally. I don't think anyone is sitting there saying, oh, I want to keep people sick and get people really sick. This is great. But I think I do think that when you have finances as the end goal, you make very different decisions and you look at very different numbers. And because of that, that allows for products to get sold and marketed as health foods that aren't health foods. And of course, the things that that really I think we we've seen and experienced as well promote proper health and perfect health and remission, they, there's no profit to be made there, no more than is being made today. You can't increase that rate, <laughs> at least as far as I've seen. So, so it's just not an industry. Uh, and, and really, medicine shouldn't be an industry. When I go to these tribes around the globe, people aren't sick. There, there's no market for medicine <laughs> within these groups. So, so I think we've kind of created this problem by accident and and now we're here and it's a bit of a mess but i think there's a real potential you know when i when i was ill it was uh 2000 to 2012 and at that time you never heard of people doing medical diets it was very rare it happened but it was very very rare or these kind of like traditional tribal diets carnivore i mean gosh carnivore has been used in the uh, many of the healing fields for a very long time but uh, like hundreds of years but 
but it wasn't something in the pop in the popular narrative. And now you can jump on YouTube. You can see all these stories of people heal, heal, healing. There's books on it. There's books on carnivore. I mean, I as a practitioner for the last ten years, <laughs> I when I when I would present the carnivore diet, I was always a bit tentative about it because <laughs> I didn't know how it's going to be received. But sometimes it's very necessary with certain conditions, and so I would just do it, and I would just use my courage, and I would I would present it, but. Uh, and explain the, the traditional ancestral basis and that it's not unhealthy and all these kinds of things. But now it's so easy to tell someone to do it. And it's very common for someone to come into my office having already tried it or been on it for a couple of years or they've done it or a friend has done it. So I think because so many people have now become sick from this uh, huge mess <laughs> that we found ourselves in. Uh, and it, the more people that get sick and can't find help, I think the more people are becoming industrial on their own and trying to heal themselves and trying these things. And because of that, it's becoming more commonplace and more household knowledge, which is a, a blessing. And really, I don't know about you, it's my end goal. I think this stuff should be known by every single household so that if someone gets sick, they know exactly what to do to get better. Yeah, it's often I, you know, when when vegans attack me, which they often do, it's always, oh, you're just so militant. Everybody has to eat meat now. No, it's that's projection. We're not like that at all. It's it, it would be just lovely that it was known, wouldn't it? it I mean, would. if people want to go eat pizza, if people want to go eat vegan, they can do what they like. Oh, I'm not bothered. Yeah. But if that was just known, you know, but then what happens if people get sick? More five a day, more fiber, yeah. more stuff like this. And then you try and present it to people and they get so angry about diet. And then one of the common things that happens with me is you're trying to present the sort of old ideas about the Inuit and whatever. And then you say they didn't really have these, these issues on their, on their traditional diet. And then somebody will come back with this huge stuff. I've been sent it quite a few times. This study on cancer among the Inuit. And then you look at it and it's like 1960 to 1980 or something. You're going, well, you know, they weren't really probably on their diet. They're probably eating like cereals and stuff like that yes. by then. But I mean, what, what has happened? You've been around a lot of these, a lot of these tribes. How many yes. are actually on their traditional diet? Or there, are there some people who sort of sit in the same village and they're on their traditional diet and they say, I'm not having any of that stuff? Or has it just not reached them? Or what, what's going on with this, all, all this stuff coming out, all the Ugali going into Tanzania and all, the, all of this sort of thing. Yes. What's happened? I think what there's percentage are on that there's a, there's a really big mix. So what I've seen, and I almost have to go by continent or by tribe, uh, and I'd love to circle back to the reason why I think so many people think meat is unhealthy as well, but we can circle back to that. So, so the, yeah, it's a big mix. So in some regions that I go to, like I was in the Amazon earlier this year, around January, February. And when I was there, especially with the Matsigengwa tribes and, and the tribes of that region, they really were still eating their traditional diet, even though they had had the rubber companies in there in the 1800s and, uh, and the illegal gold mining coming in now and the drug trade in as well. So, so they're pretty much on their traditional diets. Now, there would be regions even five days into the Amazon. And, and when I say this, I mean, it is treacherous to get in there, to get to where these people are. Maybe there's easier routes to other regions of the Amazon, I'm sure. But holy Holy smokes, was this, was this hairy? You're going down a, a road for an entire day in a big van that is not even a road. And it's going through mudslides and the drop off is thousands of feet. <laughs> and people are building the road in front of you and there's no one to get you. Radios don't even work. So you can't flare out to get help from anyone. Planes won't fly in. I called, I can't tell you how many flight companies to try to fly in. No one would land, it was too dangerous. So, <laughs> so you get in and then you get on a riverboat and you travel for several days by riverboat, and there would still be some signs of modern living. There might be some vegetable oil, there might be some flour, uh, but it would be very minimal, really. And it would be at certain regions, certain ports or certain age groups that would go towards that. Uh, some areas were, were entirely on their traditional diet. And it, it seemed to do, I mean, if I look around to, where I see the mix, I think, well, I'd like to say 
that there's a difference between the cultures that have been really respected by the outside world, uh, holding on to their traditions versus the cultures that have not held on uh, or the cultures that have been disrespected. And those tend to bring in the modern foods more quickly because they want to assimilate, right? They've been told everything about them is bad. And after so many generations of that, they no longer wanna go back. They don't want anything of theirs that's traditional. And, and then you have these regions that are a bit more proud, but I would say the Messiah are maybe an exception to that because to the Messiah, you have that interesting uh, triad. You kind of have three different Different types of villages. The one villages that are just very, very traditional, the tradition, the villages that live in a traditional way, but have the maize and the corn. And then the villages that have are eating beans as well as meat, and they think the beans are their traditional food. So, so you have kind of all three. Uh, but I do see with groups like the Maasai that even when people have left and gone to college because they're all given scholarships, right? There's a lot of things going against these indigenous cultures around the world. The church, the schools, the government, the NGOs, oh my goodness, they have not been kind. But uh, but for, for people that leave a proud culture like the Maasai, it's very common for them to come back and choose the traditional way of the modern way. Whereas if I go somewhere that's been really, um, just beaten down socially and and really repeatedly told everything they do is wrong and they need to adopt our religions and our our schooling system and our beliefs and our diets uh, over so many years that does fade and they start to just they want our cheetos you know they really want it uh and and for that it's not as exciting to visit it's a bit depressing when i go to places like that so yeah, I, I, I remember, I think you mentioned something about in a school, going into a school, uh, was it Brian Sanders and uh, finding, you know, they were showing off their food and it was a load of sort of flour and seed oils and whatever. And yeah, was... so what that was, yeah. So that was a, actually a traditional region for the Maasai. So at home, the kids were eating their traditional foods, the raw milk, the blood, the meats, we ate with them a lot. But but the schools were government mandated. And so children from the villages would come into the schools and at the schools, the government would feed them corn and vegetable oil. And so our concern was, and, and still is that, my God, you're getting these children that are in perfect shape. Their microbiomes are perfect. Their bodies are perfect. They're from perfect parents. They still have all their health. And, and this could be the start of the downfall right? Because this is starting this generation having the modern foods. And so that's why we started that foundation to, to bring the Maasai food to the schools so that they weren't having the vegetable oils and the corn and the beans. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, I'd, one of the points that you made um, was about how sometimes the younger generations are in worse health than the older generations. Yes. And, and this is this is real sad, isn't it? You know, that the, the, the health goes worse and worse as it goes down. And, and that that wonderful pick that you had of the what was it, six generations or something? Yes. Six generations. Yeah, that was the Batwa, the pygmies in Uganda. It was incredible. That was a surprise to me. I expected the, the Batwa to be in a rough state. I never expected them to be so resilient and healthy. And I, I also didn't expect the elders to speak about their very high meat diet. Everyone talks about the Batwa as living in the forest and eating the berries. But the way that they reported it, they were eating meat two to three times a day. And uh, <laughs> berries were maybe one season of the year so so they did use some of the plants as medicine but not nearly as much as I, I had seen been reported and really their main food was was meat from what I could tell yeah now there's there's something that that I find interesting we got quite addicted to this um this tv series naked and afraid have you seen any of it I haven't oh it's, it's fascinating they get a couple of westerners and a man and a woman, they generally don't know each other and they just strip them completely naked and then send them off somewhere, either into the, you know, into the wilds in Africa or into some kind of tropical jungle or whatever. And those are the places where your plant based people think you would be, sort of be like the Garden of Eden. You'll live off all these mangoes and wonderful stuff yes. like that. And then one of the one <laughs> of the interesting things about it is almost every time 
particularly if you get a vegan or a vegetarian going in there, oh, we're just going to live off all the bounty of the forest. And they'll find some shriveled up old fruits, maybe a bit rotten, a bit, you know, the monkeys have had them, bats have pissed on them, whatever. And, and they'll choose the wrong ones. And, and there's not many of them anyway. And then they're, they're always the ones that get stretched off with emergency gastro issues. So even in these tropical zones, is it possible for a human to live as a vegetarian? I don't believe so. And the ones who eat the animals no. are fine. So what's actually going on out there when they're actually eating, say in the Amazon or whatever that you've seen, when they're eating their traditional diets, exactly how much of it is these plants and plant matter and these beautiful trees and, and bearing fruit everywhere? It doesn't happen, does it? No, it's very little. I mean, even so the Matsi Gengwa is that the name is a is actually derogative. It, the Dominicans came in in the 60s and gave them that name. It means humans, but that's what they go by now. And they would call themselves Matsi Genguas. The Matsi Genguas were always naked. And I mean, OK, imagine yourself in the Amazon because it is rougher than you imagine. Let me just put that out there. It's much rougher than, I was so grateful to survive that trip. There are bullet ants everywhere. I mean, they just cover the whole floors everywhere you go. And these folks uh, walk barefoot everywhere. We had two deadly snakes walk out in front of us or slither out in front of us on the path. There's children naked with bare feet walking right next to these deadly snakes. There's bullet ants everywhere. There's jaguars in the forest. And, <laughs> and, uh, and yet their favorite thing to do is at night to go hunting naked in the dark for human <laughs> needs. Now we're talking about stepping in the rainforest with very, very uh, deadly things all around you. Sorry if you can hear my my puppy is making a ruckus. I'm sorry if it's distracting. Uh, <laughs> he's five months old. He's running all about. But uh, <laughs> but and. And they would talk about it all day. So they would make their arrows. And this was really interesting. They're real artisans. They make their arrows out of palm trees. You would think it would never be firm, but it's very light, it's perfect. And they take their young boys. So boys as young as five will go on these three night adventures to go hunting. And they're kind of hush hush about it. You have to get to know them a little bit better first because they think they've been judged pretty harshly for it, uh, for, for the kind of meats that they like to eat. But but it's what they've always eaten and it's what what has preserved their health and their mental health in such a harsh environment. So what I think people don't realize is that in the Amazon, you're dealing with incredible forces against you if you're not in perfect health. If you're in perfect health, you're great. But if you're if you've damaged your microbiome in any way, shape or form, there are parasites and bacteria and insects and animals that will just not even hesitate to take you down. And so the way that humans have survived in these kind of tropical environments is by keeping themselves in perfect health. And the thing that's done that for them the most has either been fish in certain regions or uh, meat in other regions. The region that I was in last was both, uh, it was seasonal. So depending on what the Amazon river was like, they were, if it was cloudy for the next few months, then they operated primarily off hunted meat. And when the water was clear and they could see if they were gonna get eaten by a crocodile, <laughs> then, <laughs> so they don't fish if it's not clear, see? Uh, then they would eat a lot of fish, but they've had to kind of moderate their diet in an interesting way, I'll tell you. I ate a lot of piranha down there, it's very tasty. And I was expecting to be eating the head and the eyeball and the skin as you always do in these uh, indigenous regions. And one of the first things they said as I tore into the skin the, uh, is, is not to do that. And what I learned as I lived there longer and longer was that the heavy metals that have been let into the water from the illegal mining of gold have gotten into the fish and it's gotten into the, the skin and also into the, the fatty tissue of the fish. And because of that, they've learned not to eat the head and the skin because then they themselves get issues as well. So they, they respond to the environment very quickly in a protective way that keeps them from harm. And they, the joy that they have is something that we have not experienced. I, I, I sat with this little girl. I so wanted to steal her. I mean, I always want to steal the children when I go and visit. <laughs> I can't do it. Zoomies, he's doing zoomies. I can't do it because, uh, 
because they're having a better life than I could ever provide them with. Uh, none of our children get to live the way these children live. It's a beautiful, happy environment. But we were sitting by the fire and this little girl crawled into my lap and she looked straight into my eyes and just giggled for four hours. And that's what we did for four hours. I've never felt so much oxytocin in my life. It was incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. So, uh, so yeah, so they, they are moderating their diets in different regions. I couldn't say a percentage as to, you know, who has moderated what, because it's so different everywhere I go. And sometimes it's, it is case by case. So, you know, I was just in the Arctic uh, up in Northern Greenland and there, depending on where you are, can vary greatly. You can have teenagers drinking pop or you could go to a place and it's you're eating seal and, and you know, fermented birds from a seal's belly that have been there for a year. So, so it really varies. And typically the older men are the ones that are uh, doing the most of the traditional food, I would say more than anyone else. Well, and how, how about, did you find the same thing with the Inuit, that the older generations who are, who are on those diets seem to be more healthy? Yes, always. The older generations are always healthier, always. And based on if they've incorporated modern foods in the younger generations, then you start to see the deterioration of the health. Otherwise, you see perfect health in the children if they haven't brought the modern foods in. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that really struck me was... Um, you're you're talking about the joy of these tribes you know and and, and just the, the the mental health that is possible when the microbiome is sorted out and and, and when we're in that kind of state you see it with, yes. with people getting onto carnivore diets and healing you know it's not just the physical is it so um you know what it it just it just must be magical tell us about this about just the joy of these people uh it's uh it's something i didn't I didn't expect when I first started traveling to go visit the, these tribes around the globe, I just didn't have any concept of how joyful people could be. I certainly felt when I went on the GAPS diet, this uprush of joy and tolerance and uh, peace and ability to handle things without trying that uh, that other people noticed, you know, they, it was weird to people that I was just okay. <laughs> all the time. And I loved that. And it was part of what kept me doing these diets after remission. I, I honestly loved the mental space I was in. I loved the freedom from desires of all kinds, you know, the desire from escape, the desire for certain foods, the desire for energy. I just, I had everything already you know, and when I go and I visit these tribes, the level of satisfaction of their life in all ways is so high. They've never experienced insomnia. They've never experienced anxiety. Uh, they've never experienced pain unless they break something. You know, they don't have aches like we do. They don't get headaches like we do. Uh, their teeth are gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, gorgeous teeth is that and, where you, is that uh, where you got them mary did you bring yours back did you bring back a set? Mine, mine are familial i will say mine <laughs> are familial. i did nothing this is pure luck right here my my grandpa my mom all of my sisters we all have the same thing so yeah for me it was just luck but uh but for them it's clearly the way that they're eating and living yeah yeah yeah, my, yeah, mine look crap, but there's no fillings. And, and you know, it, I, I, I sit, look at my relatives, um, you know, my mother, my father, absolutely full of dental work and whatever on the diets that they were on. And I think I kind of got lucky. And now that I've been on this, you know, there's, I, I couldn't even think of going to see a dentist or anything. It's amazing, isn't it? Teeth seem to re-enamel. I remember in my, in my fruitarian little phase that I did, um, just the agony couldn't even brush your teeth because it because it was so painful with the with the you know the the enamel wearing away and whatever it's amazing it's quite a marker of health isn't it but so um what are what are some of the what are some of the uh really craziest things that you've eaten then on your travels oh, let's hear some good bush tucker bush tucker i would stuff. say the yeah, I think the craziest things were on this last trip to the Arctic. But, but I would to say. be honest, anyone who's listening to this, they're not crazy. 
the, the Oreos and the cereals are crazy, but let's anyway, go for it. <laughs> I so agree with you. I so agree with you. We need to reframe what normal is. This is normal. Uh, what I'm about to say, you know, a lot of the things from this trip I haven't posted because I didn't want anything negative to go back on the tribes that I visited. But it's it's ironic because these are the foods that have kept humans alive in the harshest of climates. And it's respectful. And when you're there, it's beautiful. And it's amazingly tasty. So I, which I didn't expect on this one because I ate a lot of high meat on this trip and I didn't know, you know, I had had homemade uh, high meat from, from like Americans. I had not had a traditional high meat from a tribe before. So uh, one of my first introductions was uh, a very special dish that they make. This is made for holidays. So this is made when uh, families join, when someone is born, when there's been a really good hunt, these kinds of things. When there's a big celebration, they have this. And this is what Rasputin, the um, uh, the explorer, died from. <laughs> so I knew going in, maybe I shouldn't eat this food, but I had to go for it. It was too too exotic and too interesting not to. So what it is, they when they kill the seal, the seal is right now. So the seal season is actually ending about now, and they're going into narwhal season. So they don't just have an abundance of any kind of food at any time. And also just a, a one day dog sled trip, which is the only way to get around. FYI, you can't take boats or planes, but uh, just a one day's dog sled trip, then the primary food is polar bear. So it really changes based on where you go. But uh, but this first region I was in, they they love their seal and it was seal season and we were there was a big celebration. So I got to eat a lot of the traditional foods right in the first couple of days. And this one was a raw seal that had been killed and the innards taken out. And then about one to 200 small little birds called ox, A-U-Ks, that they'll, they'll catch and they'll put into the seal belly raw and then they'll stitch it up and they'll ferment it for a year. And in this fermentation process, the birds start to liquefy. And, and I had heard about this. And I remember thinking like, I mean, I'm a pretty easygoing person as far as food goes, but I didn't know if I was going to go for this one or if people still ate it. But I got there and there's all these very old ladies, just joyful as could be, just light beaming from their faces and huge grins, tearing out the little feathers from these birds and really getting in there and one of them started handing me some of the meat and I just immediately went for it and it was delectable it tasted like French duck it was phenomenal it had this umami flavor I couldn't stop eating it so <laughs> so I ate a lot and then from there I moved on to a raw seal that had been fermented for a year, but this time whole. So the whole thing had been raw fermented under the ice for a year. And that was split open and it was very, uh, very red. The blood looked so alive and everyone was diving into it. The kids had it all over their face and we did too. I have it all over my hands and my face as we're eating it. I ate the whole heart myself and it was delectable. It didn't taste like cooked or raw meat it tasted like its own thing uh almost almost a, a bit sweet actually a lot of the food tasted a little sweet and maybe that's my taste buds I should say I'm sure a lot of people would say that's not sweet but <laughs> but to my taste buds it was a bit sweet I really enjoyed that and I liked the community aspect of that dish as well another thing I ate while up there it's a bit of a delicacy it's like it's a bit like sushi would be, is uh, raw blubber. And that blubber could be from narwhal, from killer whale, lots of different animals. We, I ate it all. And that tasted like ice cream to me. It was very good. But, but I didn't know at first. I uh, took a piece with the skin still attached. And their jaws are like iron, as they are in all places that are still on their traditional diets, just lot, incredible jaws of these people. I was raised on Wonder Bread, so I could not get through the skin. I could not get through it. Uh, so I, my suggestion would be if anyone has this in the future, to cut that part off and just eat the blubber. But the blubber is the part that they like anyway. Uh, from there, I went on to quite a few different soups. I had narwhal soup. I had a polar bear soup, and then I had a muskox soup. Muskox is a lot like a, 
a bit like a buffalo for the Arctic. They have this wonderful long hair that makes an incredible wool that you can only wild harvest. So it's one of the most expensive fibers in the world, but it's incredibly warm. I forget the percentage of warmth that it has over a sheep wool, but it's very high. <laughs> so it's, it's sought after and they tend to wear it, but you have to go wild harvest it as it drops off the wild animals at a certain stage. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. But uh, but anyway, the soups were very good. Polar bear tasted like beef, <laughs> tasted no different, honestly. And, uh, and the muskox as well. The narwhal soup was more like a fatty fish soup, but you could tell it wasn't a fish, you know, it was very clear and it was, uh, it was eaten with your hands. So you don't eat it with a spoon. Yeah, the narwhal was uh, chopped up into tiny little pieces and then you just have the broth, no vegetables, of course. There's no vegetables here at the celebration at all. And you uh, go into the hot broth with your hands and then put the, the, uh, the flesh or the animal products into your mouth. And then once all of that is in your mouth and you've consumed that, then you drink the broth is kind of how it's done. It's wonderful. I could live on that stuff. Uh, it was just very, very good. And then, I mean, I could go for a long time. So you cut me off if you want, but we ate a lot of things from... I'll tell you the one thing I did not enjoy. I'm enjoying it. Go that. for it. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The one flavor I'm not crazy about, I'm okay with it, I can eat it, but it's not something I would seek out, is the flavor of blue cheese. So that kind of smoky uh, blue cheese flavor, I'm not a fan of. And they had these quite large eggs, larger than duck eggs, that they would uh, harvest and then freeze underground raw. Again, it's an incredible amount of food raw. Very few things were cooked here. And and that again is for about a year. And when they take them out, then you take the shell off. It's still a bit frozen. And the it looks very beautiful. It looks a bit like a gem that you're eating, but it tastes like blue cheese. So, <laughs> so I wasn't as much of a, a fan of that one for sure. And then some common things too, a lot of king clip. King clip was in season. We went ice fishing a lot, which was shockingly easy. Uh, you basically just put a hook in, in the ice crack and then you do this with your arm and you catch a fish <laughs> and then you eat. So, uh, so we ate a lot of that as well. But yeah, really quite fascinating foods. And, and what was neat was that in the first village I was in, there's a, about 600 people who live there total. It's one of the larger villages, it's the highest up north. And, uh, and it really doesn't take very many animals to feed these people. So there's this dialogue going on right now where environmental folks want to stop indigenous cultures from eating their traditional food and, and from selling products from this food, which is causing a huge problem because in other villages farther south, that means they're relying on grocery stores that are shipping their groceries up from Europe only two months a year because you can't get a boat up there except in July and August. So they're shipping, you know, using incredible amounts of oil to ship all these very processed foods up so that the people don't rely on the traditional foods. And ironically, when you're in an environment like this, it seems harsh from the outside. It's not, it's, it's like living in a meditation. I've never been anywhere so beautiful and so calm and so happy, but, uh, but it's, it's calm and happy because they know exactly how to live in harmony with nature. And, you know, they, they can't overfish. If they overfish, they all starve. They can't overhunt <laughs> and they don't want to either. You know, every time a hunter goes out, he's truly risking his life. We almost fell through the ice cracks twice, you know, and I was only there for a month. So I can't even imagine uh, the danger that these guys go through. And we weren't there during the most dangerous season, which is walrus season, where that ice is very, very thin and they're hauling these massive animals out of the ice. People think you can use modern techniques for these animals, you can't. If you shoot a walrus, it just sinks. If you shoot a narwhal, it just sinks. So you have to use these very difficult to learn skills and, and go on these boats that you and I would never succeed at, <laughs> probably. I mean, I'd like to think maybe we could, but <laughs> from what I've heard, no one but they can do these boats. But, uh, but you have to go out on these boats. And then, I mean, just think about the math here. You're on 
freezing water where this is not cold therapy here. You die if you fall in the water. And then <laughs> you have to pull this 2000 pound animal out of the water. How are we going to do this, right? <laughs> it's very, very dangerous. And so no one is gonna do that just for fun. Uh, they do it to feed themselves and, and to keep themselves very healthy in a very, very cold and dangerous environment. Just fascinating. I'm jealous. I've got to go and see this sometime. Now, nice. you know, I, I also people say, oh, well, you know, the Inuit and, and they, they, they also use hundreds of different types of plants because that's how they flavor their food. And, and all the tribes have hundreds of these different plants. And, and you kind of look at these studies that they send and, and they're sort of using very small amounts of these and often they use them topically only as medication and 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 then if they do take them they're very aware of of you know the the toxicity of these plants and yet people still think that everybody's up there sort of living on berries and 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 some kind of sort of quinoa salad and 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 whatever i mean i don't think up there from what you're saying there's really much of that going on right no not at all there's only there's two flowers that bloom in different regions and, and I guess I should say with Greenland, it's quite unique because you're, you're truly cut off. It's not like uh, tribes in Africa where they trade. There's no trade happening because they can't get to each other all year. Uh, maybe two months of the year, they can, they can traverse to other villages. But um, I met many people up there who had been stuck in other villages for months, even in this day and time. So it, it, the weather is everything up there. And because of that, they don't have a trade culture. So they live on the food exactly where they are. Where I was, they have two plants that they eat and it's not for much of the year at all. They certainly don't harvest it for the winter. We weren't eating it. It was seaweed and a flower that blooms uh, during the, the one only time when the ice melts. And they use that for some teas sometimes, but it's they don't really need the medicine. And one of the things I've been the most surprised by in my travels is how little the plants are used. I'll, I'll be walking around a region like with the Batwa where I'm recognizing a lot of the medicinal plants and I'll ask them if they use them. They don't use them because they don't have a need for them. <laughs> so, so the plants are not used much at all. The Maasai, of course, each village is different even within the Maasai, but the Maasai villages have gone to, I never see one that uses more than one plant and it's one plant. It's not not multiple plants and, and that's as a tea or as a, a, a bitter within their broth is where it's used. It's not as a, a seasoning really, or as a medicinal herb or anything like that. Um, so, so yeah, no, it's actually shocking how few plants. Now the San down in South Africa, Botswana, they have more of a plant knowledge than others, but that region also has more biodiversity than anywhere on earth. We, we think of a lot of the places with plants like the Amazon or I had thought of Tanzania before I went there as like, gosh, they probably have a lot of plants, but you get there and it, <laughs> you would just be hungry. <laughs> you would be hungry and then you would die if that's what you were hoping to survive on. And, uh, and so it's not, it's not the preferred food of anyone. And I think too, you know, when you look at these, there's some things that all of these cultures have in common. One would be the mental state. They're very calm and they're very satisfied and they're very happy and joyful and, and not really thinking too much about tomorrow. And they know things will be good tomorrow. So there's no anxiety. And, and so I think part of that is, is eating the foods that burn slower, that also keep you calm. You know, there's foods that promote calmness and, and in the body biochemically produce the feel good chemicals that make our body happy and relaxed and give us the dopamine, the serotonin, these kinds of things. And, and then there's foods that are short, short lived energy. And those are very, very different. And that can give you a bit more anxiety because you've got those ups and downs. And those are typically in the plant world. So, so relying more on the fats or the meats or the fish is, is what I see regardless of where I go. Uh, everywhere I go, they always have that in their diet as a base. Uh, of course, ratios are different. Some are in ketosis, some tribes aren't. These kinds of things based on where they are locally. But uh, but there's always a, a basis of animal products. Mm. So, so do you think these small amounts of plants that they eat now and again are what protects them from the terrible ravages of their carcinogenic diet? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? When you look at this, and all this red meat causes cancer and stuff. I mean, just the ancient foods don't cause modern diseases is the phrase, isn't it? It's just, it's just amazing. So, yeah. you know, basically they will eat uh, in various, various regions. <laughs> They'll eat certain seasonal things because berries are quite nice if they happen to find some, you know, that, that are growing, sort of nuts, things like that. Tubers they don't seem to like very much, but is it some kind of starvation food? Does anybody actually, anywhere in the world, actually cook up stalks and leaves as a as a? Uh, a yes, a, a, yeah, I have seen meal? it, but it's not. I have seen it, but it's not a meal. It's a side dish, and it's not excited. They're not excited to have it. So when I was with. Yeah, you know, I've gone to see the Hudsa several times and I've been with many different clans. And one of them, the women went out and got wild pumpkin leaves. But uh, but we were eating meats, we were eating the hunted meat. <laughs> so they were just getting that to make a soup for later. So if it's it, it can definitely be there, but it's not the it's not the meat of the dish, right? It's not, it's a, it's an extra thing when it's there. Leafy greens aren't too popular as I travel, honestly, and freely with the Batwa, that wouldn't be a traditional food. The pumpkin is from the Americas. And so the pumpkins haven't been over there for too long. So who knows that they were eating that a hundred years ago uh, or eating something similar, but they wouldn't have had access to that directly. Yeah, I can't think of any other group that I've seen that's had the leafy greens. No one eats salads. I mean, salads are honestly a bit dangerous in these regions. They can have a lot of bugs on them. Uh, you have to have a really perfect immune system to tolerate those. Uh, I mean, in many ways, I, I personally don't, I think the germ theory is very flawed. You have to have the right kind of Petri dish for that to go into, but, uh, but it's, it's one of the reasons I think so many people travel and get sick. They go and they eat these salads <laughs> and things that the locals are not eating. So no, I don't see I don't see a lot of leafy greens. There are some cultures that do starches with protein. There are some that do that, especially in the Latin Americas and in parts of Africa. But uh, but you have to have a perfect microbiome to be able to have starches and be healthy. And you have to do a lot to those starches to process them, to make them okay. Like when I was in Peru earlier this year, uh, the, the locals, the Quechua, they would dip the, after processing a potato for a month, okay, so it gets buried, all these things happen. For every single bite, they dip it into soil first. Uh, and then eat it. The soil is very protective. Who is doing that with potatoes? No one. <laughs> and potatoes are one of the most poisonous foods. So, you know, the solanine and, and the lectins as well. So you have to do a lot to make something like that acceptable uh, to the human body and to be able to maintain health with something like that. And again, in Peru, you they have the highest organ meat consumption than any than any of the other countries. You go anywhere and there's hearts, there's heart skewers in the street. <laughs> There's liver, there's sheep head stew. So, so it's counteracted with an enormous amount of very deep uh, animal-based nutrition as well, and lots and lots of fat and, and beautiful foods. So, uh, so when I do see starch, you see uh, a lot of the protein, a lot of the fat, and you don't see uh, the greens. You don't see, think of the French diet right? You don't see the vegetables. <laughs> you don't see that. It's not a, it, vegetables really aren't much of a thing. If, if a culture is eating plants, it's usually a starch and it's not year round and it's not the main food. Mm. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, the, the, the knowledge that's coming out now about plant toxins. I had a great chat with Anthony Chafee. Have you seen his stuff recently? Hmm. I've just, oh, check out Anthony Chafee. He's great. Okay. He's an American neurosurgeon working in Australia. <laughs> He's just sort of taking over from Sean as the sort of big ripped um, carnivore doctor, you know. But he's he's very, very hot on plant toxins. And he's got a video on YouTube called um, Plants Are Trying to Kill You. And, and and really, when you look into it, it's 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 unbelievable. You know, he, I mean, he he told me I always knew that there was a lot of toxins in plants, knew quite a few of them, but 136 carcinogens in organic Brussels sprouts alone. <laughs> <laughs> like the least yeah. toxic veg has got 60 and there's the vegans saying well this meat is so toxic i go well just name one just one yes you know, it naturally well all the hormones and antibiotics they're injected well, well that's nothing to do with the meat and it's pretty exaggerated anyway yes. but that's something i want to ask you is when you're out there mm -hmm. in any of these regions 
it's difficult, I suppose, to separate it as well from just how wonderful the places are and how good, how much of a feeling of well-being that will give you. But yes. how much do you think your body likes those real traditional diets, even compared to the great diet that we can have here with a lot of fatty meat? Is there a huge difference? Yeah, there is. It's just um, I always eat where I am, wherever I am. And you're just very satisfied. You feel good. Uh, it's I don't know if I could put a word to it because it's it's not something I had experienced before I had some of these foods but when you eat them you just feel good like when I drank blood for the first time this messiah this is animal blood I'm not a vampire uh, <laughs> when I drank blood for the first time it was like the first experience of having liver it was like I, I could feel the life force I felt vital I felt um spunky I felt energetic in a very healthy, strong, level-headed way. And, and you feel that with these foods. So when I'm out in these places, you're not wanting anything else. And it's always remarkable to me how simple everything is. The cooking, the preparation, the sourcing, uh, all of that kind of stuff is all, all very simple, which is also quite relaxing. So. Have you have you ever come down with anything, any sort of illness out there, anything from getting constantly bitten by every, anything, or have you always no, remained pretty healthy? No, I've been incredibly healthy? lucky. I mean, and I, I, know, was... I know you messed your knee up recently, but uh, I did. Uh... I fell through the ice in Greenland. Yes, I did, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was totally worth it. The um, and it's recovered remarkably quickly, so I'm good. But the uh. No, I haven't. I've been really lucky. Now the people I travel with always get sick. <laughs> they always get sick. But I always go in uh, on uh, either just carnivore. So I'll be carnivore for a few weeks beforehand, or I'll be in ketosis. I'm always in ketosis when I travel. It's a natural antiviral state. I feel very good in it. I like not being hungry and being able to fast for long periods of time. So I'm always, and then I also have a very healthy lifestyle still. So I have a pretty solid morning and evening routine and all of that. So I keep myself in good health, which I, I really think helps uh, protect you at least to a level against these things and then I also have some hard fast rules like I don't swim in fresh water <laughs> I learned my lesson when I was 18 about that and uh and I don't eat salads I don't eat raw raw food unless it's an animal product it's come from a tribe and uh maybe that's it but I I don't eat the sweets the carbs the things while traveling and I think that's really helped uh, everyone I travel with tends to get a lot of the belly stuff or flus those kinds of things but no one so far has gotten anything deadly or dire <laughs> so we've, we've all been okay oh uh, that's brilliant you know something yeah. I, I I I'd like to 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 know is People think that, you know, in, in these tribes, all the circadian rhythms are absolutely perfect and they all have wonderful sleep and things like that. But then if you look at something like Naked and Afraid, I mean, OK, they're the Westerners that are shoved out there, you know, making their own little shelter and getting bitten to death. And in the morning, there's not a centimeter between bites and all that sort of thing. So they're not sleeping at all. And then they're terrified of the animals. And then it went, how well do these tribes actually sleep, the indigenous people? What are their sort of sleep patterns and cycles? Well, take it tribe by tribe, because when I was in Greenland, we had 24 hour sun. So people really only slept about four hours a night. Uh, and it was hard to sleep because you don't have blackout curtains or anything like that. And you feel energetic. You feel incredibly just awake and calm when you're there with all that light. So, so that was part of it too. But everywhere else I go, it's a pretty, pretty good sleep schedule. In the Amazon, you were usually asleep by eight. The tribe was asleep by 8 p.m. That's the sun sets around 7.30. So once it's gotten dark, you just go to bed. And they sleep in elevated kind of planks. They kind of have plank houses with no walls. It's like a deck. It would be like a deck. And it the reason for that, of course, are the, the jaguars. <laughs> so they have to sleep elevated. But... Uh, but no, honestly, the bugs don't bother you too much. Now, with some tourists, they can. I've been really lucky. I'll get a couple bug bites, but I, I'm not a, a bug magnet, luckily, so I'm okay. 
but they do have I have had friends have situations. I have a friend, Alan, who got dropped off by a plane in the Amazon, didn't know what he was getting into with a friend and ended up staying with this tribe for a month and uh, sleeping on the floor in the dirt and the bugs were just everywhere. They didn't have a single inch that wasn't bitten. The tribes, not at all. They weren't bitten at all. So I really think the traditional diets and lifestyles Put yourself in a bit of a vibration that doesn't attract the bugs. I think, I don't know if you've ever gardened or not, but with a garden, there's often one plant that gets sick and it will attract all the blood, the bugs. And I think we are the same. I think we're very similar. So if we have a weak link, it can make us weaker, 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 and other things pick up on that and come over. But uh, but no, in general, it's it's been okay. But I, I think that's probably a unique experience that I've had. I do travel with catnip oil. Catnip oil works really well externally uh, to repel mosquitoes. And I, I personally find a difference with myself if I'm not eating any carbohydrates versus if I am for if I attract bugs. I don't know if other people experience that as well, but I really notice that. So I always play that game. No, totally. I, I I remember being in India, um, traveling around India for for quite a while, um, sort of ninety nine, two thousand, and I think there's something about my right buttock that gets uh, that attracts carbohydrates because <laughs> I used I used to have hundreds of mosquito bites on my right buttock, but never on my left. And no, it isn't the side I sleep on. It was really bizarre. It no, was really interesting. Odd. I don't know what happened there. But I tell you what, I do I do a lot of night fishing. You know, I go out and fish for carp and yeah. whatever and on these lakes where you have, are out at night. You have a bivy and you have the rods out on bite alarms and whatever. So you're out there all night. And I used to get bitten to death. You know, even in England, we have mosquitoes. But, but now I notice, I, I can't remember when I last got a bite. And I mean, some mornings at certain times of the year, I wake up and, and there's yourself on this bed chair and there's a, a bivy and... And there's hundreds of mosquitoes hanging off the roof of the, of the ceiling, you know, in the bivy. And I look up and I think, hang on, I haven't had a bite. And this has definitely been since keto and carnivore. Yeah. And, and they've, yeah. they've I know it's a huge difference. They've left me alone. Yeah. It's yeah. part of why I am always in ketosis when I travel because the bug bites keep you up and then you don't sleep as well. And then your, you know, your immune system is impacted the next day. And I just don't get as many. I might get one or two, but I won't be covered. Yeah. 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 So what other sort of great adventures have you, I could just ask you about your adventures <laughs> just all day long. I'm going to have to keep an eye on the clock. I've had so many. I've but, had so, even know, just this year alone. What have recently? What, what marvellous ones spring to mind? I'm so fascinated about the Arctic and stuff because I haven't heard you talking about this much. No, I, ha I think I haven't talked about it on a podcast. I don't think I've talked about my Amazon trip either. Um, uh, no, it's the Arctic is... And maybe I need to go in the winter as well, because I went in the summer. Well, it's not quite their summer. It's their spring. But to them, they will call it summer because they feel that it's very hot. I was covered in seal fur head to toe. It was not hot. But <laughs> but uh, but it was totally different than I expected. I Having traveled so many places, I... I've seen that no one heats their house the way Americans do. We just keep it the same temperature year round. And, and so I, I can go to places like New Zealand that aren't necessarily cold or Greece in the winter and it'll feel freezing inside because it's made out of stone and marble and maybe it's not that cold outside. It's only 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but still. So I was expecting to be freezing in the Arctic. And I wasn't cold once. I wasn't cold at all. Granted, I was very properly covered and dressed and I, I wore all the, the wool and the silk and all of that, which FYI, if any of your listeners go to the Arctic, do not wear the modern gear. Don't go and get like the, <laughs> the snow gear, get their clothing. It's very, very effective. <laughs> You're very comfortable. You can be outside all day long and be very, very comfortable. The, the modern fibers made out of plastic are so bad for our health and, and aren't as warm. So I, I met a couple of uh, documentary teams up there that were in all the modern clothing and just struggling. <laughs> go buy fur from this guy over here. <laughs> You'll be really, really happy. So, uh, so no, it was, 
but it, it was like being in a meditation. The sun is out at all times. There wasn't a single cloudy day and the sky is almost sherbet colored. And then the snow sparkles like crystals. I can't explain it. It has the whole rainbow color in the snow at all times, glittering. And then you have these turquoise blue icebergs, which I didn't know that the icebergs moved so quickly. I thought that when I would look at icebergs, it would be, you know, maybe it would change every few days or something, the landscape. No, it's like watching a moving painting at all times. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. So you go out and you walk on the ice and the main place that I was staying in, I went to about five different locations, but the main place that I stayed in had the ocean frozen over out front. And so I would go out and walk on the ocean. You could walk all day. I took dog sled trips on that to get to other places and, and all those kinds of things. But um, you, you'd be outside for 12 hours and think it was two. It, you just get so present when you're there. It's like living in a dream. I can't, I can't explain it, but I, I, I think everyone should go. I think everyone should go. And then the food is so good. And you feel, and maybe it's from all the light and then the joy with all the people around you and then the very good food that you're eating. But you just feel great when you're up there, despite the lack of sleep. Most people weren't, I, I'm a great sleeper. Like it's my superpower now <laughs> after healing. And, <laughs> and I think I was averaging three to four hours of sleep a night. They would all be deep sleep. I was, I was measuring it because I was curious, but, uh, but three to four hours, but you wake up rested. You don't really need coffee. It's really neat. Wow. Yeah. So among the, among these different tribes, <laughs> the ones that are on their actual traditional diets, are you noticing yes. any particular um, general difference in health um, yes. uh, from the sort of cold regions to the to the hot regions, the ones that are, uh, oh. are absolutely in, or are they all completely sorted? Are they all completely in? No, the they're all completely sorted. Yeah, they're just completely sorted. And in a way that no one would believe if they didn't see it. They're just perfect. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And and this this sort of myth of 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 uh, no old people, you know, they all die young and whatever. We know it's you know yeah. trauma care, you know, infant mortality and whatever. But also, I heard um, uh, you speaking about at one point. I think that you know they have very easy births and stuff, and there isn't very this crazy easy infant I mortality. Haven't, I haven't seen this infant mortality. Yeah. I think this is coming from places that have adopted a modern diet. As soon as you do that, things change very rapidly, uh, especially the more extreme cases. So like if you go to the villages in Uganda that are far out, which is easy to get to because most of Uganda is <laughs> it's pretty sparse. But, uh, those places, birth is easy. You go to the major cities like Kampala, it's different. It's still better than we have. You know, they're actually in better shape than we are in many ways, not in all. Uh, you've got AIDS and things like that in many of the countries, but but function, high functioning AIDS, you know? So, so they have some of these bigger problems in the big cities, but they're also eating primarily corn and vegetable oil. And, and they're told not to eat meats in those countries. I, I, I can't tell you how many people told us that their doctors had told them to stop eating the foods that they like so much, which was always meat and fat and to eat more corn and vegetable oil and their health conditions just progressed. And when they changed, uh, they would send us WhatsApp messages about how these were more city, city dwelling folks in these countries about how everything was going away. So, so you do see, so I, I, I'm sure there is infant mortality in the cities. I've gone to a lot of hospitals and things. I don't, I don't see it as a big problem, but I'm sure it's there. I really don't see it in the tribes. When you ask the tribes, they, they've never heard of it. So it, it's not a thing. And, and when you ask about how people die, it's just in their sleep when they're very, very old. And we know, I, I know they're very old because I see all the generations. So even with the, with the tribes that aren't tracking their birthday, you have so many generations <laughs> alive of a family that, that do mark it. And they do, even the tribes that don't track birthdays, because not all cultures do, they still know within five years. You, you know a five-year-old from an infant. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no confusing that. So we always know someone's age within five years. But no, I haven't seen that. Um, I, I know that the Hudza tribe, the one that 
Paul Saladino visited as well. That one had had a couple children die from the cold. They don't wear clothing, you know? So if a cold would come in in the winter, like a freeze, a very young child uh, could die, but it wasn't a common occurrence. You know, it had happened a couple of times in, in their lifetime. So that's less than we would have, you know, um, uh, SIDS or whatever it's called, where a child dies in a crib. So no, I, I don't know where they're getting these figures. It's not something I'm seeing at all. Some, somebody's fiddling the figures. There's also, I've heard some, some theories of, of when they've actually dug up these bones and they think that they're 30, 40 years old, that they might even be way, way, way older. They're just basing it on what they think 30 or 40 year old bones. Were. Ah, that could absolutely be it, Phil, because they, they, they at 80 are like us at 30. So that could absolutely be what's going on, 100%. Yeah, so I, think it's... I can say in the elderly that I see, then they don't have the cavities and things. Mm -hmm. So so their bones, I, I say that because that relates directly to bone health. Uh, their bones would be very good as well. Yeah, and, and it's funny, isn't it? It's such a shame that it's out there. All, all these tribes die young, and they die young because they eat a load of meat. And yeah. the terrible brainwashing that's happened. I hope it comes around because, I mean, look what's happening at the moment with this war on meat and these sort of, yeah. you know, they pretend that animals have these pandemics and then put them all down and stuff. And Yes, you know, these... I've been seeing this from afar. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's horrific what's going on. And they're buying farmers out. And, and Yeah, that's been going cats. on for a long time. Yeah, and all these cows just dying, you know, just like 10,000 of them all heaped up. And what's going on? And the farmers are saying, no, it isn't anything to do with any global warming because there's been much hotter years and they didn't have, it didn't happen. I don't know. I'm a bit of a tinfoil hatty, you know, and I think there's some <laughs> really, some really weird shit going on with these people. They don't, they don't want us eating meat. They don't want us strong. They don't want us smart because we'll see through what they're doing. But, well, if we're, if we're muted, if we don't have all our faculties, we're, we're very easy to, to manipulate right and a population that's easy to manipulate is ideal for many people <laughs> for people that want to do that kind of thing what i'm seeing though is that i i don't know how that that will pan out for very long because now, I come from a, a semi-military family. My dad was a scientist for the military and had gone to the military school when he was younger. And uh, in the military, they can't even take most of the recruits now in the United States because they're so unhealthy. So I don't know how just basic functions are going to operate in a country when everyone is so sick and everyone is so so dependent on medic dependent on medications and things like that. I also don't see how the economy can afford it either. It's extremely expensive to be sick for the individual, for the families, for the society. Um, you know, there's this, this whole fat acceptance movement going on right now, I'm sure you're aware of. And, and I think if we had that mentality towards anything else, we'd be in so much trouble. When I was sick, I felt like it was my duty to get myself better. Like, no, it wasn't my fault that I got sick. It's never someone's fault to get sick. But it is our responsibility to get us as well as we possibly can to be able to function in society. And that's the case with any kind of, of situation. Um, so so with more and more people falling into illness, I don't see how societies can function very well unless something changes, which is always a good opportunity. Yeah, and some, something I, I read somewhere that you'd said of, of, of what a blessing illness is quite often. Yes. <laughs> and how it just, you know, my, my book I called Arthritis, the best thing that ever happened to me. Because yeah. it is, you know, it, it, it brings you through. And when, when you do a consult, instead of, going to the doc and they say, well, you know, you're, you're so sick and you're going to have to take these pills forever. Otherwise you'll be in a wheelchair or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and you just say to them, Hey, you've messed up a bit, but do you know what? This is going to be such a journey. This is going to be so <laughs> much fun. And you're going to come out the other side, even better than you went in. And what a different feeling of an attitude, isn't it? You know, when, if somebody tells you that at the beginning of a consult, cause you know that you can see it reversed from all these yes. hundreds of thousands of useless anecdotes that are there with no studies and all of this sort of thing. Yes. But hey, you know, some, something I want, I want to ask you about, about all of these tribes, how, yeah. 
optimistic are you? Is, is this lifestyle coming to an end or are they going to be left alone at some point? Yeah. I, I, is, is Western Western life encroaching um, um, too much for them to survive these 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 um, traditional ways? What do you think as you go around? I'll tell you what, some places I think are done. Some places are done, but that's uh, their choice because they have they want to assimilate now. I think other places could easily be saved, but it needs to be done right now. And the way that it would be done would be through respect. I think if we could, we could really honor the wisdom that these groups have, the wisdom of health, the wisdom of joy and life quality, the wisdom of knowledge that they have. I mean, if we if we separated, let's take indigenous or tribe out of the conversation. And if we just said, we just found this country where everyone is happy. They're all totally happy at all times. They sleep great. They've never been anxious. They're utterly satisfied. No one has to work, FYI, amazing. And you get to hang out with your friends all day. Uh, they also have never experienced real illness and they die in their sleep. I think we would all want to know their secrets, right? <laughs> we would all want to know what they are doing and why everything is so good. And if we could come with that approach instead of the approach of we need to save these people or we need to uh, convert them to our religion or we need to educate these people so they function in our society. Instead, I think if we immediately flip the script and, and saw them as our teachers instead of some, some kind of project to improve, then, uh, then we could absolutely keep these cultures going on. A lot of them do not wanna change their lifestyle and, uh, and would prefer to stay as they are. Now, in terms of environmental coaching and things like that, there are some things that are shifting. Like uh, one of the villages I went to up in the Arctic had been displaced during World War II, only about 20 miles, but that's actually a lot in the indigenous cultures because then things are different, animals are different, the weather is different, all these things. And they've had a couple of things go against them. There was a nuclear bomb accidentally dropped in the water about 30 years ago, which has added to the toxicity level. There's heavy metals in the seals from some of the military actions there. And, uh, and so sometimes things like that can cause an issue to where a group needs to move locations, things like that. And I, I know with the Maasai, uh, my Maasai friends are, are under threat at the moment. Uh, the government is talking about taking more land again. So, which I, I didn't think was gonna happen. I, Tanzania gets a lot of tourism dollars from people coming <laughs> to see the Maasai, which is part of why they've been able to maintain at least some of their traditional villages. But, um, but yeah, so I think it's absolutely possible. But I, I am an optimist in all ways in these things because like with you, the worst things that have ever happened to me, like the illness, ended up being my ticket to ultimate freedom and joy. So I think so often these big challenges are, are an incredible opportunity for something even better than we can imagine. Wonderful. You know, it's it's funny, isn't it? This is this is something that I I learned through my healing pro process. But it's obvious now that on so many levels that that we've been taken away from our ancestral heritage. And you mentioned something really important there that they don't have to work. You know, they don't have to work. They don't they, they don't have some worry that a bank's going to take their house back because it's on a mortgage or something. And you know, if they want to build another house build another house, no one's going to take it away. And this is, this is just beautiful. It's so, it, 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 it's so important for people to realize how far we've come away from that, how much we're in a constant state of stress. And, yes. and you know, I, I, I've been, you know, a, a, just an old hippie and I've lived in teepees and buses and whatever, you know, in my youth, and I've never had a work ethic whatsoever. So I think that's kind of that's kind of helped me on the way a lot of the time. It hasn't helped me very much financially, but it's helped me to have a, a, a great life with a load of, of freedom, you know, and, and, yes. and, and not, to, not, to, not to be caught up in the rat race. And, and when I see people, you know, just the, the, the artificial nature of, our, of our, our world, this is what we've gone into in the, in the Red Pill Revolution book that we've done with my amazing colleagues, you know, and we've got one just coming out. We must get you a copy. You know, we must send you a copy. It's I would great, love one. 
the red pill food revolution and i i think it's one of the best but i can say that because i'm only a quarter of it you know because <laughs> the, other, the other guys are just amazing you know with 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 this and coming from all the aspects all the financial and the spiritual and the and the, and the just you know the ancestral and how it's been ruined over the over the years and how far we've come how far away we've come and all of these modern dietary trends they're sort of pushed by people and two people who've never even been to a farm, let alone into a rainforest. So they have no, it's easy to say, oh yeah, you know, eat this, eat this avocado. It's ever so environmentally friendly and it's ever so kind to animals. And, you know, I, it's such a, it's such a deception, isn't it? But it is a complete deception. It's a missing of the mark. It is, isn't it? Totally. So is, is this, is this your passion now? You just want to get, you get itchy feet all the time and you want to, charge yes. off everywhere where's next? i'm dying to i i really i'm dying to go i'm hoping to go to mongolia in a couple of months uh, oh. to go see the eagle hunters i've got a trip booked right now in october we're just waiting on the flights to open uh to that region because right now they're closed and uh and i'm i've got another trip planned up to the arctic region of norway to go visit the sami people i've got a few different friends up in that region i'm going to go visit and they'll take me around and then i very much i don't have this planned but my dream right now i'm dying to go to papua new guinea i want to go spend some significant time in papua new guinea i have some connections there but i haven't booked any flights or anything because there's there's about 700 different uh indigenous communities there and some are are, are very unique and very different than those that I visited before. So I'm just dying to go there. As soon as the borders open up, I very much want to go to Hong Kong. Hong Kong has the highest uh, meat per capita, and they also are unique to China because and, and the longest lifespan, but they're yeah. also unique. Blue zone yes. now, aren't they? Yeah, 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 I like to call them red zones. I call them red zones. But yeah, <laughs> the, uh, they're unique to the rest of China because they were because they were kind of taken over by the British instead of the communists for that hundred years, they were actually allowed to keep their traditional medicine there. And that wasn't the case in many parts, most of China. A lot of it, if it was kept, it was hidden for a very long time. And so it's, uh, it, there's apparently some very interesting stuff in the healing world in, in Hong Kong. So I'm, I'm jonesing to go. We have a family friend who's been living there for five decades. So I'm very excited uh, to go there. And and yeah, so those are the things. And then I, I'd like to get back to Japan and go up to the northern regions and all of that. I have a friend who was uh, raised in the islands between northern Japan and Russia, kind of that in-between zone. And it sounds like it's an Arctic diet, just basically fish. <laughs> you can basically live on fish and, and whale and that kind of thing. So I'm quite excited to go up there as well. But yeah, I can never get enough. I mean, my dream is just to jump on a plane and go somewhere new tomorrow uh, that I wasn't expecting. So <laughs> fantastic. Are you, are you going to try some of that hallucinogenic reindeer pee up in up with the Sammy? Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. How could I say no to that? <laughs> yes. Carnivore hallucinogenic. It's beautiful. Isn't it? <laughs> I can't wait. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I want to try the reindeer uh, yogurt as well. There's some really interesting reindeer products that I'm, yeah, very much looking forward to trying. But yes, yeah, hallucinogenics and I'm in. Did you know, ayahuasca, uh, most of the strains of ayahuasca, the plant are not hallucinogenic. I learned that on my last trip to the Amazon. They're used as a medicine, but not as uh, hallucinogenic, actually. So only, only, uh, only one of the types of vine are hallucinogenic. Wow! No, or, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked into it too much. I mean, only just hearing tales of people doing it and whatever, because it doesn't appeal so much. I think I just overdosed so much on psilocybin mushrooms back in in my youth. <laughs> I mean, yes. really enormous doses. I only did it for three months, but I'm like that sort of extreme thing where I just, it was a huge heroic doses every night for three months. And it, it took me about 30 years to process it. And I thought, I, you know, I, think, I think I've had enough now, but you never know. You never, never say never, you never when you're know. out in these places, you know. You never know. And also you and I, I think we have a similar trajectory. I've been in remission a little over a decade, right? So kind of similar trajectory timeline. I think once you go through something like that, you just really like to be here. 
you know uh yeah there's not like a, a desire to to go elsewhere as much you kind of want to be here you kind of you worked really hard to get here so <laughs> yes yeah. yeah and you value everything so beautifully don't you? i mean every every yes. step i take particularly not even someone upstairs but downstairs which you know i couldn't even do and and now to be able to run downstairs and play drums and and, and that sort of thing you're just continually grateful now aren't you it's great it's feeling. i know it's lovely yeah. it's lovely yeah, so I mean, look, it's what, the greatest gift of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm going to have to get you back a few more times after each adventure, you know, because I'm just selfish. I, I want to hear all these stories, you know, if I can't do them <laughs> at the moment. But uh, as, soon as, I'd, as soon as we can, I'd love to be able to take the kids out. I just, you know, I won't jump through the hoops that they want to go on the airplanes and stuff at the moment, if you know what I mean. And so... <laughs> We'll see. We'll see what happens. But so tell everybody, I, I, you know, this is probably a good good point to finish on. And, and I've, I've grabbed your time for quite a long time now. But what uh, tell people about about your your where they can find you and about your um, consultation practices and whatever. And, you know, all your all your sort of healing stuff that you do. It's wonderful. You, you know, you're doing such amazing work out there. And where, where can everybody find you? And keep up with your adventures and get consults and whatever what do, what, what, what do you yes. want people to know well you can find me at enableyourhealing.com i've actually i've done something huge this year that took two years to get to and that is that i've i've paused my favorite thing in the world which is one-on-one -on -one client work i really really love it uh and i live for it honestly it's like going to the gym i feel great afterwards but i've paused it because for the last two years i've been watching uh more and more people develop long covid and i i've worked in the post-viral area for over a decade obviously it's one of my specialties and uh you know we saw this with ebola we see this with different viruses but uh it, the condition that I had was post-infection and post-infection damaged the nervous system and the hypothalamus. And, uh, and so while I've been doing my, my one-on-one -on -one in, in my groups, I've kind of, my heart has been pulled into places because I saw the number of dysautonomia cases go from, dysautonomia means a deregulation of the autonomic nervous system for your listeners, uh, go from very few cases to over 70 million cases worldwide. So in January, I made a really big decision and I sent out a big email to all my clients saying that I was going to pause everything right now so that I could put together a program for what would what people could do to reverse their long COVID, their dysautonomia, those kinds of things. So I've been working on that and we just launched two weeks ago. So I'm very excited. Uh, that's going really well. And, uh, and so as that gets going, then I can go back into play with my practitioner training. I did practitioner training for a long time. So once I've got that fully on the rails and and uh, kind of streamlined and red carpeted for everybody to kind of get themselves into remission if they so desire, then I'm going to focus on the practitioner training and then get back to doing all that I do. But I always travel at the same time. So <laughs> you know, I don't take too many days off. <laughs> Great. So you do consults and stuff when you do them, you do them just traveling around and stuff and find, you know, ways to ways to connect while you're traveling. I do. Cool, cool. I do. What I was doing before, I've done it in many different ways through the years. But over the last year, what I went to was working every other week. So I could go a week in the field and then be a week in my practice and then a week in the field, a week in my practice. And uh, and now I still work that way. <laughs> So I've still got that. So I work on my project one week and then in the field, project one week and in the field. And that's worked really well. That's fantastic. Well, yeah. Mary, my kids are making a tremendous racket now. Oh no, that's fair. Cause Phoenix, my puppy was like, he's usually so quiet. So I let him just stay out. He usually sits <laughs> at my feet. He's so calm. He's like a stuffed animal, but he got zoomies for like an hour today. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't hear anything at all. No, my kids, my oh, kids good. have been good as well. But he's so. becoming a teenager. He got his hormones in the last three days. So things are going to change a little. Okay, <laughs> cool. So, yes. Mary, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. It's oh, absolutely you, fascinating to talk to you and um, hope to talk to you again and get you back in future episodes. And thank that you so much great. for your amazing stories. I just want to hear hundreds more of them. 
Phil, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to meet you. I have loved your story of healing and the way that you've brought it out into the world and shared it with so many people over the years. I think what you're doing is invaluable. I think your story is invaluable. So many people think your condition is irreversible. And I think you're just a beacon of light for tens of thousands of patients out there, hundreds of thousands. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you for having me. And we'll have to do it again after my next trip. We will. Yeah. And, and I'm really honored that you say that. Thank you very much. I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mary, thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs>